Oh. Can you hear me right? It works. <laughs> We're all good. Okay, so we'll let some people come in, um, and I'm going to get my headphones sorted out because they don't want to be on, apparently. Um, so... All right. And so, hello, everyone joining in. You just speak, Sophia. Hi, everybody. Is that working? <laughs> it's not coming through Hi, my headphones. But hello. I will. Uh... Hello. This is the first time hello, I've everyone. ever done this. Never done an Instagram live. Oh, it's all, it's all part of the, the fun of doing, being in quarantine. <laughs> Have you been doing loads of these then, Ben? Ah, oh, I can hear you now. Say that again? Okay, have you been doing loads of these? Yeah, so we've been doing this uh, for... Oh, I will tell you which number you are. Um, I've got my trusty book here. This Hi, you are number 12. Hi, from Spain. Wow, that's so cool. So yeah, again, been going 12 days and it's been... Yeah, really great. Really good busy, response. Busy bee. Yeah, <laughs> I had a day off yesterday, which was a nice, relaxing day I off. I saw your picture with your girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, I just didn't touch any sort of technology. It's all the whole done. Day. I just have a break, yeah. have a breather. It's so it can feel too <laughs> intense right now, can't it? With all the on, on, constant online. Mm. Hi, yeah. Woody. How you doing, mate? Um, so yeah, um, I think that's enough people in now. Hi, everyone. Hope you are doing well today. Welcome to the quarantine zone, as we're calling it. Uh, so the quarantine zone is a daily live chat at 6 p.m. British summer time. It was GMT, and then I only realized the other day that when it, the clocks are changing, so I had to change absolutely everything. So hopefully you people have cottoned on and joining in anyway now. Um, so yeah, the quarantine zone is a daily live chat where basically if you are at home and you're feeling lonely and anxious or whatever it might be, uh, because of the quarantine or the self-isolation, social distancing, whatever you want to call it, uh, we are, you know, we're going through some tough times and it's a chance for about an hour a day just to escape from all that, learn about somebody new, talk to some awesome people and, yeah, um, escape from all that and maybe learn how other people are coping with it and, and how they can help you out. So today I am absolutely Pleasure to introduce you, Sophie Morgan, uh, and I will allow her to introduce herself a little bit more. So over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Ben. Hi, guys. I was just saying to Ben, this is the first time I've ever done an Insta Live, <laughs> so this is cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Sophie. Um, I am a TV presenter, as well as an advocate, an activist, campaigner. Um, I'm also a disability consultant. I do lots of different jobs um, and currently um, I'm in the UK. I'm living up down at my mum and dad's for the, for the lockdown period here. Um, and so, yeah, about, I had my injury, I had a spinal injury when I was 18. So that's 17 years ago. Um, I had a car crash and I broke in the crash my T4, 5 level um, and I'm a complete spinal injury. So, yeah, so since... Since my injury, I've, I've carved a bit of a bizarre path, um, doing lots of different things. Originally trained as a painter, as an artist, but now I've kind of moved into television where I do documentaries um, and I do uh, live para sports. So most people would have ca caught me on the Paralympic coverage, which was the London Games, the Rio Games. And obviously I was gonna be going to Tokyo, but that's not happening now until next year. Um, so I do the coverage of the games, the, I'm the anchor in that. Um, but also, yeah, do, I've done lots of different documentaries, whether it's Dispatches or Unreported Worlds or uh, various documentaries from the BBC as well. Um, and yeah, it was actually, really gutted I was about to do a big travel show on my motorbike uh, which I'd love to talk to you guys about actually my mm. um my Riker which I I just got and I was going to be doing a big tv show traveling around uh, southeast Asia on the bike in time to get to the games but that's just unfortunately been cancelled so yeah um so yeah travel documentary sports and then on the other side all my advocacy work and I do lots of stuff around disability um, and so helping people both here in the UK, I'm a patron of Scope and Backup. So I do stuff around at home with disability, but then also 
internationally work for Human Rights Watch and Lumos and Lena Cheshire and do lots of campaigning over this for, for various different issues to do with disability. So yeah, busy bee, lots of different things. Yeah, so if that all sounds good to you, make sure you stick around for the <laughs> this. We'll be diving into I'm a lot more of that. Um, <laughs> if you do have any questions, if I find my pen, I will write them down. <laughs> um, it seems to have gone missing a second. But yeah. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, I'll write them down as it goes through Instagram so you don't have to keep scrolling back. But yeah, um, Sophie, let's dive into your life, your, as we like to call as, on some of the other um, chats we've been having, your previous life. Yeah. <laughs> so your pre-injury life. Do, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that leading up to your accident? So I was, um, I was quite young, I guess, when I had my injury. Uh, I was 18. So before my... my injury I was just a kind of just a kid just did my A-levels just on my GCSEs that kind of thing I was at school and I had my accident the day that my uh, I got my A-level results so I kind of um yeah had my childhood uh and not being in a wheelchair and there's not yeah other than just recounting boring stories of being a kid there's not much not much to say I was a baby mm. really did you have many plans at that time to, you know, because obviously at that, you're like in a transition sort of period of that age of your life. I, for me, I had my accident at that a little bit. I, I was a year older than you when, when I had mine. Um, and yeah, it was definitely sort of a, a transition period. I was actually training. I was training for the 2012 Olympics as a swimmer. No way. Um, so yeah, that was my career path. And I I'd already sort of set mine out and I was on my way. What about yourself in terms of, That's did you have any nice. ideas for your future? No, I, I think the only future, the only plan I really had for myself was to travel. I just mm. was keen to just disappear into the world and learn what it was like out there and, and just kind of be free and not really think too much. I had worked towards getting a place at law school. So that was kind of my plan to go to university and study law. Um, but no, nothing like you. No, nowhere near as ambitious. <laughs> or clu I was clueless. I didn't really have much mm. direction, I don't think. Not like you. Yeah, well, um, I think I was a bit of a rare case in terms of definitely focused on it because I was two years into my training cycle because mine was in 2010 so yeah it was I was like I'm gonna get there sort of thing and then I did yeah um so um straight after your so yeah oh, do you want to talk about the accident itself um and explain a little bit more about what happened there sure so I was I was driving back I was sorry I was at my A-levels um was, uh, like we had a big party me and some friends had a big party for when the when our a love results came in and basically um on the night of the of the party me and some friends left one party to drive to another and on the drive i lost control of my car and um and crashed and it crashed and was immediately paralyzed in the crash um it was quite a brutal crash um thankfully no one else was hurt just me and i was driving again which is all good, I think, in terms of like the management afterwards, psychologically, yeah, totally. no one did this to me kind of thing. Um, but I suffered quite extensive injuries to my face and body. So it took quite a lot of rehabilitation and, and surgeries and lots of stuff to kind of pull me back to, to one person because I was really pretty broken. Um, yeah. And so I went into, so I was injured in Scotland and then I was flown down to the UK, sorry, flown down to London. And then when I got to London, I went into Stanmore and was rehabilitated there for, um, I was in intensive care for a while and then I went into rehab for, for three, three or four months, I think it was in the end. So, yeah, the, the, the real recovery was around my injuries first to do to my face. I was completely just destroyed in the crash. And then so once that recovered and was restructured and rebuilt and I was able to start eating and all that kind of stuff, that's yeah. when I was able to then focus on the rest of the injuries, you know, the mm. spinal injury and, and then went into rehabilitation and did all that good stuff, the learning again, you know what it is. You know what yeah, it yeah is. definitely. Um, yeah, it's like being a child and having to learn to walk yeah, again, but yeah, not walking. Know, <laughs> that's it, learning <laughs> everything again. Um, so, but Stanmore was an amazing place to be. I was so lucky to be there. I mean, it's top notch care, and it's compared to places all around the world, we're so lucky here in the UK to have what we have with the NHS. It's just given what's going on right now and how, you know, people talk about the, the need for the, the, the value of the NHS. We know for first hand just how yeah, I wouldn't be here without them. And they, it was extraordinary. So lucky. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always say that I owe them my life and yeah, yeah I wouldn't be the same person I am today. No way. Might not even no. be here alive. So. No. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it actually, weirdly, there was talk at one point, I think, because the wards were full when I was trying to go in, they were talking about putting private. And even if I had, I think the care wouldn't have been as good. The, the level of attention and the quality of the support and the care and everything we're just the luckiest people in the whole world. And I've got friends who've got spinal injury, I'm sure like you have in the States and stuff. And the cost for us to recover and to get back to where we yeah. were, you know, if you were there in the States, bankrupt you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, oof. so we're so lucky. Yeah, extremely lucky. Yeah. Do you remember in those times, like um, your thoughts, because obviously being 17 years ago, it almost seems like forever. Mine was 10 years ago. It's like, it seemed forever ago. Do you remember um, like, how you were coping with it like mentally as well as sort of the physical side of getting rehabbed i i yeah, i'm sure like you i get I get asked that a lot i mm. think at the time to, yeah you're right it's a blur it was a long time ago i do remember being very determined and very focused to, on getting back to life again i was just because i think mm. i just left school and i was like yeah, i'm free and then i was like Fuck, oh god now i'm back in hospital and like i <laughs> i want that feeling of freedom again so i had that real appetite for life that got me through it quite a lot at that point I was very determined I remember being quite stubborn and and also quite um I think quite sort of just brave in that I was like right I was young you know and you mm. have that kind of right I can do this I can do this so I think it became very much a can-do attitude but I was so lucky to have the support of my friends and family at that time who were next level rocks like just yeah. picking me up and scooping me along and just dragging me through it all and I yeah so I think as much as I can say I got myself through it you know I really I put my hands up and say that my friends and family were the just they were that they what I needed to to help me through so I credit them with my mental positivity and and all of mm. that but yeah it was a tr tricky time I think though if I'm honest the tough time came afterwards in the in the go back into the world mm. and adapting to um, life as I you know and, and trying to get to university and trying to you know go back to dating and all the kind of stuff that you do at that age and like going out clubbing and raving and all the stuff that I wanted to do that was the hard stuff you know that kind of brutal like jeez how do you do that so that so the hospital bit was like almost the easy bit it was the going back outside into the real world with the real people that was scary how about you yeah. were you the same um, well, the, the, the reason I always ask this question, because I'm always curious, because in hospital, like, there wasn't really any negative time, because no. I was so focused on getting better, and I had a purpose, and I had a drive, Yes. and I know when I was in hospital, I saw, like, two ends of the spectrum, there's either people that were like, I'm going to get out of here as best as possible, and then there's people that, like, you know, the like, complete opposite end of the spectrum, I'm always interested to hear people's side of it and like why they feel that way because for me i i always had the passion of going to the olympics so i was like okay i'm just gonna You've go to the paralympics now yeah, yes so my goal. so my focus just changed I'm like, okay we'll just go to the paralympics that's fine and i just thought yeah. well, i'll just train and train for that instead um so yeah i had that focus in the drive i was like i want to get better as possible so i can do that um that's awesome. it's just because you were saying you want to get back out there traveling yeah so. i think that's it i think it's the same it's not it's not, it's cliche. I think that when you do have that, something to hang your hopes on, something to work towards, even if the goal, even if the plan changes, the kind of the goal stay the same, if that makes sense. Mm. So you kind of just go, right, well, that was one plan. Shit, okay, we're not gonna have to adapt and do, do something different. And that, yeah. that power to adapt, that, that ability to adapt, I think is, yeah, is so important. And I, yeah, I basically, just like you, I kind of, just went right okay i've got a set a target and go for it and then just went for it but it, it it i think life got hard or things got harder um as i started getting stopped in my tracks and my plans start getting like like changed by people or by inaccessible places and i was like hold on i've got all this stuff i want to do don't get in my way but that's that's <laughs> the, the world in which we now I know very well now is the world in which we live and it's, it's not adapted to us so it's that mm. constant having to adapt to the world that makes life as a wheelchair user not so straightforward yeah 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 um so yeah because um again with myself in terms of the toughest time for me was actually four years after my injury um I started doing the swimming and I realizing that my love for it wasn't there like quite the same I couldn't quite swim the same way as I was before 
because I was training by myself because I couldn't keep up with the people I used to be training with. So I was training by myself. And um, yeah, um, the love for the sport wasn't quite there anymore. Um, so I quit. So you lost your so, purpose. Yeah, I lost my purpose. And that's when I was actually upset and depressed. So um, yeah, it's, um, it was, it wasn't my life changing injury. It was my loss of purpose. But yeah. like my, my attitude was like, I didn't have a purpose. So I, I was trying to think of the way to say it. Like, I couldn't. It didn't matter. Like, get... I, I, do you know what? I completely, I totally relate. I think once you lose your purpose, you, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you lose mm. your sense of like love and passion and purpose. And, 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 and that is where I think people can relate now, actually, because yeah. some of the things that I've been talking about this a little bit, sorry to go off track a little bit, but no, no, just, we like the to go off track. Yeah. We're in now, I think people can relate to that a lot more than before because yeah, people's definitely. choices and people's lives have been taken out of their hands for, for, for a time which is yeah. something that we've had to deal with. And so, you're, you know, if you've lost your purpose or you lost your, your plans have had to change, it could be very frightening. And that's something yeah. that I completely think that we've, we've had to, to deal with. So losing your goal and not knowing what your focus is, I think that's when life really is, becomes the hardest. It doesn't matter if you're disabled or not. Yeah, I, definitely. I'm, I'm just... totally with you. And, and, and for me, constantly, ever since my injury, I've had to set big goals to mm. be cool to be to be okay to just keep yeah. going and and it therefore all of the other stuff the other shit that goes with spinal injury just kind of falls away because there's a point in the at the end of it all um and i'm i'm that's how i roll and it sounds like we're very similar yeah it's totally it's um i reached out to my friends once it's once it started realizing like the magnitude of it and how we'd have to probably stay at home for quite a long time and i reached out to them and saying like I've been through this and for probably quite a lot longer than this is going to happen because I was yeah. in hospital for seven months. So I was yeah. like, yeah. like I've gone through this kind of thing. So if you need any advice or any yeah. tips on how yeah. to yeah. get through yeah. it, like, Do like know, it's, it's, we're the most valuable people in society now. <laughs> I think it, again, it's something that we're seeing a lot is that disabled people right now are kind of cropping up and going, Hey, I've been here before. And you know, that I was saying this only recently. I just had, a, I, when I, unfortunately I suffered um, a period of time where for health reasons, I had a pressure sore. Well, it's not pressure. It was a long story. It was a cut, yeah. uh, and I had to go. Uh, it formed into an ulcer, and that ulcer had to be. Um, I had to have it removed, and then I had to stay in bed. It was on mm. my bum, my, right on my bum cheek, so I couldn't sit on it. So I had three years of bed rest, and I like you know you kind of think six months or three months or even a week. It's like you know it's like nothing. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> and that actually, since I've spoken about some of this recently. People are coming out on social media saying, mate, I've been in bed for 10 years and I've done this yeah. for a month. You know, it's, it's the lived experience of disabled people. So it's really like, it's a really interesting time to see how people will empathize more with that and how actually mm. disabled people can offer some insight into how to manage all this stuff right now. Yeah, definitely. And seeing that, I just saw a question pop up and see it's related. So someone said, my daughter's injury completely upturned my life. I don't know, just um finding a purpose since then is something i've struggled greatly with how do you cope and press through um is that had said so, say so that question again ben how did she or how does her daughter um well i guess she said i how i've struggled but i guess it would whatever we say here would re, um relate to both of them i guess okay well i i think the how do we break this down i think that there's areas in life that you have control over um, mm. And if we can talk about this in context of, of the lockdown that we're experiencing now. So there's things that we can still do. There's lots of stuff we can't do, but there are things that we can control. And I think that can go from the smallest thing about like, you know, what we eat or when we sleep or how we exercise to mm. the biggest things like what we want for our job or what we want for our partners or in our relationships or something. And I think just break it down into certain little areas that are, are manageable, like what's your goal in for your health or for your relationships or for your wealth or break it into areas in your life that matter and then set manageable little goals there. You know, like, uh, so for example, with me, when I had my injury, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was 18 years old. I had a blank canvas ahead of me. I hadn't got a clue where I wanted to go. All I knew was that I loved certain things. Like I loved painting and I liked art. So I was like, right, okay, that'll do. And ever since then, it's kind of been a series of 
just saying, yeah, okay, that'll do. I'll take that. I'll go there. And then setting more and more uh, small but achievable goals. Um, so I think to the goat, finding your purpose thing, I think it's just doing what you love, but making sure that you set a goal that's not going to break your heart if you don't get there. And yeah. it, whilst it's important to set massive big dreams and all those, just make sure it's not something that if you don't get there, that's going to really, you know, make you feel even worse about your situation. So yeah. I think, I hope that makes sense. Um, no, yeah, it de definitely does. Um, I was just, I was ready. I know what, um, I think that it's a unique opportunity to like do something that you maybe thought you would never would be possible for. You're in a situation where, you know, lots of people are going to forgive you if you're going to start doing things wrong. Like you're not going to get judgment. We were saying yesterday that nobody actually has enough time to care about you. <laughs> it's as bad, as bad as it sounds like most people are too worried about their own lives so just yeah. focus on yourself focus on you and your daughter and just sort of have this unique opportunity to say okay what would do you want to do in life and what are the steps to get there write down the goals um meditate on it and just sort of use this opportunity to I mean, loads of people in their life would be like i wish i could change my life but they're stuck in a job that they don't want to do and just, it's if you have the opportunity to do it just go for it and I think, and I think that that that's an important point that you make, Ben, because I think this whole idea of like the opportunity is, some people might think it's it's too it's it's not obtainable to them, or there's there's barriers in the way, and of course there are, especially if you have a disability, there are very real barriers, mm. but also there are barriers that we can we do have control of and we can remove. So, yeah. but it, look, this is a bit of a mad example, but I'll give it anyway. I I my work in television and in trying to improve representation of disabled people on television, I, um, I, th I really did set that as a goal, but it was something that I also knew was kind of out of my hands. It was, it's a funny one. So I kind of, mm. in my head, I wanted that to be something that I could achieve, but it wasn't until the wider community, the wider society enabled that to happen. That I was, the door was made open. I was pushing on the door. Don't get me wrong, but um, the door wasn't opened until the industry itself was ready. And so, I use that as an example of like ha set your intention as best as you can and work towards it and yeah. just, just just keep your expectations measured I think because people aim so high sometimes and it's only it leaves you just with a sense of disappointment that you haven't got there but mm. actually just having the intention itself is enough to be proud of yourself and to have purpose I think that's if I, I hope that makes sense yeah yeah definitely um uh, digitally design said um said with most said people key life decisions are in other people's hands and for some people yeah that is yeah. true they there are things and that's yeah. why it's really important to focus on the things that you can yeah. change that's you it. can f change your attitude towards it your thoughts your feelings and how you approach a situation like uh, if you're totally run out on care and you can't see yeah, you're just, like I a c3 like, so pod point, i think this is it it's like there's the big things and there's the small things hmm. and for people with disabilities I think we need to put into context when we talk about, you know, setting goals and plans. We're not like everybody else because there are limits, there are restrictions mm. and we have to be realistic. Uh, and I think that's really important that, you know, you don't want to jeopardize your health and your and your mental health by just setting goals that really physically you can't achieve. Not just because you can't don't want to. Sorry, not because you. But not just because of your own physical limitations, but also because, you you know, there's things that I want to do, but I can't do without other people's help. And I get yeah. that. And that's dependency. And that's something we all have to manage. But again, it's about just just thinking, right, what can we do? That's it's, it's that shifting of like, right, what is it that we can do? Even if it's the minimum, even if it's just being able to like, I can just do this one goal this day and it's just a small thing mm -hmm. that can make all the difference. So. It's a reconfiguring of perspective, and that is what I think, personally, my injury did for me, is just reconfigure my perspective on, like, right, it's not about what I can't do. I survived. I lived it. I lived. I, I didn't die. So what can I do? And that's probably what I live with every day. And actually, having been on lockdown and bed rest for a long time, and maybe this is something people can relate to now a bit more, when you do find yourself stuck at home or you do find yourself not being able to do what you want to do, when you get out the other end, you go, right, shit, what can I do? What can I do? The world's like open. I mean, that's why I've gone and done some crazy stuff like bought motorbikes or, you know, throw myself out of airplanes and stuff because you get a new perspective. So I hope now we kind of get an idea of like, cool, right, what can we do? What's next? Mm. And have a real research. And look, there's so many resources out there to find out right now. I mean, you, the world is so 
online we can find yeah. out anything about what we want to do so i feel hopeful anyway yeah. i'm rambling no 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 we um we like to ramble here that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's what makes this a little bit different to um something a bit more formal it's a chat between friends as i call it rather than a chat between friends down the pub. i just think it's, it's a funny one you know ben i I think it's something to be really conscious of with this, this, mm, this goal setting because I've become addicted to goal setting ever since my injury and I set my bar higher and higher and higher and I've got myself into some crazy situations as a result. Um, but I have to be very conscious of the things that have enabled me to get there, whether it be my pri and the privilege that I come into this with, whether it be the fact that I've got a support network or that I've um, had a good education or that I have, you know, found at the right job at the right time. There's, there's certain conditions and it's very, I can never say, oh, go and aim of doing this without putting into context all the other things that make those things possible. So it's very important to, to speak to that. But at the same time, you've got to start somewhere. And I, I think there's something really powerful about the people that have lived through disability. They are so adaptable and mm. powerful in their thinking that I think apply that to anything and you can go pretty far. Yeah, we were saying the other day how it, like I think that this will be good for the disabled community in terms of showing how adaptable like how yeah. we're so good at this and like how that's so employable as a skill like if, and hopefully it will mean that on the other side of this that there will be people realizing that the disabled community have a lot more to offer because of yeah. their skills of how they have adapt how they've adapted and yeah. yeah people like yourself and other people that are online trying to like promote it is really important because it means that the wider audience get to see it and like yeah. oh they're doing all right so yeah yeah <laughs> exactly um, so let's move into post-accident now um and moving into obviously you're you're most well known for your tv presenting um so do you want to explain how you went from having a car crash to being a TV presenter. <laughs> yeah, it was actually very, very accidental. Um, I was, I just had my injury and I just left hospital and I was, um, <laughs> I was at home trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do. And my, I got a phone call from the occupational therapist from Stanmore and she messaged me to say, look, the BBC has been in touch. They're looking for um, disabled people to go on a trip. And I think you're totally crazy enough to do it do you want me to tell them about you? Do you, want, do you want to be put in touch? And I was like, what is it? What is it? Anyway, it was this show, this, this show that was called Beyond Boundaries on BBC Two. And it went out about, uh, yeah, 2004 it went out. So that long, long ago. And it was about a group of disabled people that went across uh, Nicaragua on foot. On foot, I say, in my chair. But we were all disabled and we all went across uh, the jungle together. It was an amazing, groundbreaking show. They hadn't really put disability on TV like that before. And um, I was a part of that. And after that, it kind of just dominoed. I got invited to do some presenting here or be a part of a show here or whatever. And then I pitched a couple of ideas. So, um, so I started doing more documentaries that were kind of more led by, as a presenter as opposed to a contributor. And then yeah. it just dominoed. And, and, and then I got the biggest break of my life, which was when I went and got the job presenting the Rio Paralympics, um, which opened the door for me to do all the stuff that I've been doing recently, which um, is really varied. I've done a property series, I've done a documentaries, I've done, yeah, Dispatches and Unreported Worlds, which have been amazing. Uh, mm. Again, more Paralympics, um, and I was just about to do a big travel show. So it's been an amazing journey, uh, absolute privilege. I, I love it. It's an amazing job. Yeah, it's, it seems like you have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's, it's, um, it matters to me because I, I kind of mm. try and try and leverage it to to use it as a platform to to speak out about stuff mm. that matters to me as a disabled person and as a disabled woman and as a woman um but it's um it's yeah the landscape's changing i mean I've, i don't know what's gonna happen next for me to be honest because i had a big big show that i was doing but it got cancelled so mm. i don't know what's next it's it's a very <laughs> kind of one minute it's one thing one minute it's another so it's it's a it's a brilliant job but it's a changeable job yeah yeah um so what I wanted to, I was going to ask you after a bit, but I, it seems appropriate to ask now. So how do you think like the attitude towards sort of disabled people in media has changed since you started in 2004? Um, I've spoke about in the past how London 2012 was a big shift. But how, how is it, that's from somebody looking from the outside in yeah. as a disabled person. How do you feel it's for yourself 
being inside the media, how has stuff changed over the years, or if at all? <laughs> it's changed uh, slowly. It's it's been really interesting to be part of. Um, I think the perceptions around disability still sit within sport. So mm. most disabled coverage, most disabled programming is still around the Paralympics. So the games come around and you roll out the disabled people and shows get made and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But mm. I think it's a kind of, it's, it, 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 the, for me, the biggest successes have been when um, I've been able to present on shows or when we see disabled people presenting on stuff that's nothing to do with their disabilities whatsoever. Um, mm. So like if I made a documentary and it's not, I don't even get to reference my wheelchair yeah. and stuff like that. You know, that's, that's really cool. But yeah, that doesn't happen that often, um, and uh, that's a, that's a slow burner. But I think it's improving. I mean, I think I think it's improving. I just I think this, the the general public can uh, be hard to please. They find disability a bit confusing. Perceptions around disability are quite polarized. You get on one mm. hand the kind of superhuman, and on the other hand you get the benefits scrounger, disabled person. It's, so it's yeah. a very mixed bag and i don't think it's a real representation of disability that we're all just normal you know we're we're all there's a middle ground there that that needs to be represented better so i i i would say that i want the industry to keep moving forward but it's come a long way and i'm very proud of of being part of it and i'm watching it grow in different directions and there's some amazing talent coming through like but i yeah i think it's got a way to go yeah um it was interesting what you said about the the big divide between like there are, there's one end of the spectrum and the other end. And that's kind of why I started adapt to perform because there was one end of the spectrum, which is like high end athletes or bodybuilders that are in wheelchairs. And then there was the other end of the spectrum, which was, uh, I've started looking at YouTube videos for myself, but the other end of the spectrum on there was seniors in wheelchairs doing some arm oh, swings. Okay. There was nothing in the middle for like the 90% of people that want to be in the middle. Yeah. And you'd know you're doing amazing work. It's mm. so needed. It's very, mm. very needed. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, um, when you were saying, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Oh, the, the, <laughs> the two types of people. Yeah, so the two types of people, and um, what you were saying about there's not really much in terms of people that are just there because that is, and like the public's perspective of it. I think that it's important to sort of almost force the issue of getting safer people on TV because I always believe if information is the key to having like acceptance of it you know when people are you know, they, they don't know how to react to it because we're not on tv no. doing normal stuff yeah. we're only on tv being the superhuman yeah. or the benefits scrounger there's no representation across a wide range of people yeah. and i think it needs to be like that for it to be okay and be understanding and you kind of almost need to make exceptions in the first place just to get people out there who are disabled um, and then it's sort of the ball start, then people start to understand they start, and then it can be a bit more normalized. I don't That's know how you it. Can... And, and pulling in just the normal lived experience of disabled people is where we'll see, we'll see the changes happen, I think, and, no, and we'll normalize that. But like at the same time, TV, I don't know how much we see any, the normal person represented on TV. It is, it is a world where we go to be entertained. And so I can see the need for kind of, the putting disability into a format that makes it in, not intimidating or sad or anything. They want to remove all those kind of perceptions. It's, but I, yeah, I feel very strongly about just kind of putting the normal stories out there, not yeah. you know the sad stories or the hero triumph stories, just the kind mm. of normal stories. Um, and I think that's slowly happening. Um, it's just, it's just slow. <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you, um, so on the other day, I had George from Sex, who's Isaac in Sex Education the TV okay. show, on the Netflix show. I haven't show. seen it. I haven't seen it. So I think you would love, he's in season two anyway. So okay. I think you'd like it because he's he's in a wheelchair, he's got spinal cord injury, he's quadriplegic. And it's clear that, you know, it's very good because you can clearly That's see awesome. who he is. And so he's but, main, is he like a main part in this? So he is, he's a main part in the storyline. But what I love about it is he's kind of the bad guy in it. Cool. Which is like totally oh, opposite of what would normally happen it's always the story have. is like you're like this poor little victim or yeah. someone who needs to be saved or someone exactly. who wants yeah it's awful yeah oh, and he's got awesome. like a dark he's got a dark sense of humor about his disability and i'm like that is like every single person i meet who's in yeah. a wheelchair yeah. all of them have 
uh, awful with their, it's like, you can't talk about this stuff outside of being in a wheelchair group. And just like, <laughs> and it was just like, it's so good. Like, um, and also they were showing some things that, so there's a part of the show, um, and apologies for those I've already talked about with George, but yeah, there's a part where he's at the top of the stairs and ready to go into this house party. And I was like, oh, they're just going to cut to black and he's going to be inside. But there's this massive set of stairs. But they were like, they addressed how he would have to tackle it. They're like, well, nice. how are we going to get you inside? And he's like, just when he sees like four blokes, like, do you mind carrying me in sort of thing? And it's just like, well, that's what happens in real life. Yeah. So they've done a fantastic job. Oh, that's really yeah. brilliant. That, that is the, tr that's the key. So that's when you've mm. got realistic stories and, you know, I had to have the same thing when I was presenting and stuff. And I was, I was making a show where I was reporting in areas that were completely inaccessible. And I, I actually wanted to sh like, can, can we show me how I get here? Because people watching me to, sh to know that this is the way it works. Like, instead of just cutting to me being sat in this amazing spot reporting, you know, it's mm. like that. that Hello. Hi. I can't hear you just yet, but you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? What happened there? Well, I was off. rambling on about how brilliant that is. I have to check that out. That's awesome. Oh. Right, you see? Hello? Hello. Oh, I can hear you. Okay, I don't know what was going on there, but it paused and then my headphones stopped working. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely recommend going and checking out that oh, show. watch that. Definitely. I think you'd really enjoy it. And also they had, the reason it's so good as well, they had his input as well. And like he was saying things along as they were going, they oh, took it on board. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. And uh, if you want to hear more about behind the scenes of that stuff, and that, yeah, I would definitely recommend checking out that interview. Oh, that definitely, too. I will. Thank you. Um, so somebody said this uh, about, yeah, you don't want to have a pity party because we get enough of that on the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then Helen said, seeing others on Instagram helped me realize, Jesus, I can do things like before and live the life yeah. uh, to the full, seeing everyone do amazing stuff. When when she was first paralyzed in rehab, she thought her life was over. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't know about your, your thoughts about the impact on social media, but from somebody who's, I mean, my life pretty much revolves around it in terms of putting my stuff out there. Yeah, um, it's. I think it's such a important part of our lives for the better. And um, I think that this period of where we're inside, a lot of people are inside. They're starting to see the benefits that we've seen from it. Like the people that are, yeah. you know, generally more at home. Yeah, we can see the benefits of it. And I'm sure you did when you were you know, on bed rest as well. Like there are positive yeah. social media, and I think that's getting more shown now. I think you're right. I think there's so much, especially for people like us that can tell stories. I mean, I've loved getting to hang out with people like you and like bringing the community together and people actually like reaching out to each other and, you know, looking after each other and kind of sharing stories. And that is the power of social media. I mean, it's dangerous when we spend too much time on it and it can be toxic. But I think for people who can feel marginalized and who often when they're out and about can feel people don't really understand them or they can't relate or whatever there is something really powerful about finding a community online where you can you know learn and grow and share stories and and also like find out about how other people have managed with what they've had to manage with and things like that i think it's just incredibly powerful yeah yeah i i think there's a lot of opportunity for it there to be abused but there are a lot of yeah. opportunities there for it to be yeah. really something that br brings us together so yeah it's just how we use it. And I think on the other side of all this, I think we'll be a little bit closer to being on the good side of it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So what some of the work I'm doing right now is to do with like consulting, uh, like if you want to say now, I mean like today, doing mm. with consulting with retailers on how to manage looking after disabled people, because um, obviously disabled people need priority treatment if they're in the, in the higher risk category. And like they should be getting to the shops and they should be getting the delivery spots and all the stuff that we're seeing in the news for looking after people, but mm. they're not getting it. So um, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes to try and like sort out how do retailers get this right. 
And it's exciting, to, if I'm honest, because they're not getting it right just yet. A lot of people are still struggling and suffering and not getting the food they need and care they need and all sorts. But as everyone gets their ducks in a row, I think it could leave us on the other side with a really interesting set of systems that might be implemented to help provide better goods and services on the other side. So mm. I think there is, I, I'm with you, I think that the, uh, the other side of this, there will be a shift in perspective around disability and what it means to be disabled. And I think that's, that's good. I think that's hopeful. Oh, yeah. things coming um, in. It's so cool. Seeing, uh, I haven't seen any of these questions coming through. Oh, um, I've been writing them down as we're going through. If you do have questions, guys, um, if they fit into the topic we're talking about, then um, we'll answer them then there. But if it's something that is additional, we'll answer them near the end or whenever we're talking about that topic. Um, so, yeah, um, and I'm sure other people want to say, but I, for one, am really glad that we've got someone like yourself who's on that end of it, doing the consultant work of it and really pushing the agenda. Because, um, yeah, without you, we'd be worse off. So. <laughs> well, thanks, mate. I mean, it's one of them where, you, if I'm honest, I feel like I get, I get this feeling of responsibility of, like, mm. I've got the... I've got the contact details for somebody at some at Sainsbury's. Fuck, I should probably talk to them. Do you know what I mean? I feel that feeling of like, I've got to do something. And it, 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 that has led me down a lot of paths I've got, I've got to, where I've kind of gone, oh, I kind of know how to reach out to that person. I've got to make it work. Like, I've just felt like I should. And then I end up in some extraordinary places, like speaking. And I feel like I'm speaking on behalf of a community. And actually, then I'm like, right, I've got to get this right. And it, there's... It's it's an important job, I think, and and I, I'm I love looking at all the other advocates around the world and in the UK that speak on you know speak out and speak up, because if we don't, people speak for us and then they get it wrong, and that's yeah. where I talk about this fair representation. You know, that's where when other people decide what disability looks like, you get this polarized, ridiculous mm -hmm. representation, but when we speak for ourselves, you get the good stuff. So that's kind yeah. of how I feel. We have to speak out, and so. Yeah, that's kind of, I think I'm going to put a lot more energy into that now with given where we are with the world and, and how important it is that we move forward collectively and no one gets left behind and, you know, everything's done a bit more kind of inclusively. That's that's what I'm going to push. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm glad you're doing it because I sometimes <laughs> feel like I should have to do it, but I, I have no knowledge in this. Do you I know, know what, about no, fitness. I think, I think it's, <laughs> so the areas where you, you're working is really important. We all find our little areas and I've found my areas are obviously the media, but very much in travel and trying to change travel because I find that it's, it's something I love and I'm drawn to but it's so difficult for yeah. wheelchair users um I'm not just talking about financially I'm talking about everything you know and that's where I really want to put my energy to and then in retail too so there's certain areas where I've just found my little like right foot I'm going to push on those doors and you know and we each are and I think that's that's as a driver and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier the purpose that's my purpose, I feel. And then sometimes I kind of think maybe that's why I had my injury, so I could do this work and make a difference. And that gets, it speaks a bit bigger to the whole kind of why question, which I don't spend much time thinking about, why did this happen to me? But sometimes, you know, when you feel yourself making a change in the world, you're like, shit, okay, cool. Maybe this is why this happened. And it feels good. That's kind of how I, how I tick, that's what makes me tick. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, I, I understand what you mean by like feeling like you need to do it. Almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think but so. You put in a good, put in I, the right I, I just want to kind of make a difference, and also, I, it's selfish. I want to make a difference so that my life's better too. You know, yeah. making it better, making travel better for people, or making, you know, doing, making small changes. It can help lots of people, but it can help me too. And that, so it's it's altruistic and selfish. So it's it's there's lots to it, isn't there? Yeah. No worries. Um, why well, actually put a video out yesterday talking about. But exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's a, I've talked about it a couple of times on these live streams, but it's a Japanese principle called Ikigai. And it's a like a balance thing. And it's all about a reason to get up uh, out of bed in the morning. Yeah. It's a balance between four things, which is something you love, something you're good at, something the world needs, and something you can get paid for. Um, like and that. it's a combination of those all four things, which is the, is the actual terms of pushing yourself to have a happy life and to be successful in that happy life as well. I love that. I love that. So, that's really cool. I'm going to share that. That's really nice. I think, yeah, that's what matters. Yeah, because yeah, if you don't help yourself, then you can't help others as yeah. well as you could do if you weren't. So you need to have that balance issue. Like, because a lot of people think I need to be, like, if I want to help people, I have to be 100% focused on them. 
Mm. It's like, if you are, then you can't be. Because yeah. you can't be doing it as well. Your 100% would be better if you're giving 50% to yourself. Your yeah. 50% there would be more than that 100%. Yeah, and yeah, actually, yeah. you know, I, I think about the sort of the wellness, what it means to be well. And, and since I've, you know, you focus on your fitness and your well-being, and, and that's focusing on yourself. And the more, the better you are, then the more you're able to go and do stuff. It's, mm. it's, it is, I think it makes a lot of sense, putting yourself first in order to help other people. It's, yeah, it makes total sense. <laughs> um, or, while we're on this sort of topic of, we might as well just dive into what we're do, what you're doing at the moment with. I know it's something you did the other day with you were wearing a helmet out and about. Um, seeing about like talking about helping other people. Do, do you want to just explain about the helmet? <laughs> That's probably... My bike. Uh, well, you were wearing a helmet to go through like the was it the airport you were going through or something? I can't uh, well, so what, this is me talking about my motorbike. What, no, you had it. your red and yellow helmet on, a uh, red and orange helmet on, or is it red and red and white? Red and white, sorry. Yeah, and I. And you were going around town with it on. Um, yeah. Because I because I just got my motorbike. What did I well, it, it looked like you were protecting yourself from getting coronavirus. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was joking. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the, 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 basically, I just I. I came out of bed rest, um, with this long window of bed rest, um, three year window of being on bed rest, which was horrendous. And I came out of it and I was like, right, I want to go into the world and do some amazing stuff. What's my dream list? And top of my list was to show, to go traveling around the world. Um, and I wanted to figure out how to do that. And so I found this bike, which is this Riker made by Can-Am, um, which is a complete game changer. And I planned to go around the world and Channel 4 then said they were going to televise it and follow me on my journey. And I was going to ride to the Paralympics. So over the last four months, I've, well, even more, six months, I've been out on my bike. I've been like getting all my gear, getting everything sorted, la, 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 la. I've been amazing. And then they obviously cancelled it, literally, because of the corona thing. So I've been rolling around in my freaking helmet and on my bike <laughs> being like, I want to go somewhere. <laughs> but I can't, obviously. So I'm at the moment, that's all been put into the... Put it in the garage and that's that. So yeah, so I was. I, I think that picture you're talking about was me going through the town. I just was wearing my helmet, kind of going, <laughs> "This is the safest place to be because actually it is." Because you're on your if you're on your bike, you're on your own. It's like being on a, yeah. motor, a bicycle. You're on your own. You're in the you know, you're kind of socially distancing just by the nature of what you're doing. So yeah, <laughs> it was a dream. It was a dream come true, but it's going to have to wait. Like lots of yeah, things. but I think it's um it's cool because um. It reminds me of a little bit of um, Ewan McGregor's like Long Way Down and Long Way Round. Well, that was what inspired it. It's, it was, yeah. The show was called The Long Way to the Games. And it was going to be this long, crazy journey across the world on my bike. And I really wanted to talk about the lived life, like the lived experience of being a paraplegic and having a wheelchair and having to manage and using the bike as a means of liberation, but also the consequences of trying to travel and trying to stay places and... We were going to meet interesting Paralympians along the way from different countries and speak to their journeys and what it's like to have disabilities in different countries. So a lot, it was going to be really exciting, but unfortunately that's, that's not happening anymore. So I'm trying not to think about that. But yeah, the bike, I can't, I cannot stress enough just how awesome it is. And they're new to the UK. They start from around nine grand. So they're expensive, but they're not like insanely expensive. And I can't recommend them more. <laughs> But, uh, I'm also in isolation. If anyone's in a position to be able to save money, which none of us really are, if you are, save up for one. They're the best thing you'll ever buy. <laughs> um, yeah, you said that's expensive, but um, which actually brings me on to another thing I was going to ask you about. You were saying before, um, I remember reading a long time ago, you were talking about almost like a disabled tax and how expensive disabled... Was, was that you? Yeah, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That's yeah, so, so like... Um, I'm sure all the people that are watching realise, who are disabled, realise how expensive Everything. our lives can be. Everything. Everything. Um, do you want to talk about what you think of it and what do you think should be changed or what can be changed or what you are doing to help? Well, you? yeah, so the original piece of work that I did was a commission by Scope that I worked on with a group of other people that looked at the kind of extra costs of life and how much extra we have to spend on average just as be, just for being disabled and it's it worked out at just over 500 pounds a month on average mm. which is crazy uh, just literally for being disabled and of course the benefits that we get do not come anywhere near covering that 
and you know it it's absolutely crazy how much money we have to spend so there is the cost of being disabled which i speak about a lot and i think that therefore there's there's a danger in like you know wheelchairs are so expensive everything's so expensive it means that our lives are so restricted because of the money and I just find that really sad that what the things that we need to be able to just live a normal life um, are just, it's just so much money. But I do also often speak about the value of the purple pound. And as a demographic, we are worth catering to, to bring in our spending power. So for example, the local pub to me is not wheelchair accessible. And every mm -hmm. time I go there and I'm like, why haven't you got a ramp? And he's like, well, not enough to say, well, people never want to come here. I'm like, well, mate, if you put a ramp out, they might. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's this chicken and egg and demonstrating the demand and then getting the supply. It's, it's important. And so a lot of the work I do with retailers is about trying to prove that we exist and that we can bring money to the party. So therefore make yourself accessible to us. So it's two sides of the thing that two sides of the coin that I talk about. It's the, uh, unfortunately the, the way in which we're priced out and how unfair that is, but also the fact that businesses and service providers need to be better accessible and mm. there's a value to them they shouldn't just do it to, to be good they should do it because yeah. they'll make money um so mm. that's kind of like two of my agendas i, I talk and talk about yeah no i i again i couldn't agree any more than you with in terms of like what you're talking about with a pub i remember there was a pub nearby that had accessible accessibility and it was one of the only ones and because of that my wheelchair yeah. rugby team used to go yeah. once yeah. a week every week and get pretty drunk and yeah. spending a lot of money in there. And I, and I, and when you start demonstrating that on a business level, like a bigger level, so like working with, you know, we're getting figures from big hotels, like that have, have, in, have, have not just complied with, oh Christ, excuse me, <laughs> the phone just rang. Oh, I don't even know how to turn that off. Sorry guys, everybody listening to that, that's really draining. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, um, when you look at businesses doing that, so when like huge corporations actually start making um, those changes and we, as a, as a group, as a demographic, start putting our money there, there's a benefit to them. So it's like trying to, trying to prove that. And that's, that's, my, that's really my mission in life is actually to prove that to, with retailers. Because the minute we start to prove that we're valuable, that they will start making themselves accessible mm. and our lives will be easier. We'll start being able to go places a lot more and get things that, that meet our needs. And the prices will go down for yeah. all, these, all these products that are essential to us you know it's a, there's such an important it's a domino yeah um what you're saying with the big change in that um i don't think necessarily people who aren't disabled realize like on stuff like facebook groups and that we have quite a strong community and when something's good we tend to say hey yeah. this one was really good yeah and then we go oh okay when i'm next in town i'll stay there or i'll yes. go there instead it's absolutely like, and, and and actually what, what's important i think is to mainstream that and to see, to show, like, to find, you know, like magazines that speak about traveling and have accessible parts of that and stop keeping it niche because it's not niche. We're, not, we're a huge demographic. I mean, the figures are apparently one in five you, people in the UK recognize themselves as having some form of impairment. So that's a huge, that's a huge market. So there's, there's lots to it. And I think that the more we bang on those doors and make that noise and make that bang on that drum and say, we're here, then our lives will get better. Then people will start doing things better for us. Yeah, my my friend that was on, was he on the first? Yeah, he was on the first day we did this. He was he's uh, made an app. Um, it's called. Uh, pretty sure it's called Access Rating. I think he's watching today, so okay. he might put it. He might put it down. But it's called Access Rating. It's kind of like, you know, the food hygiene ratings. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but for access. So it have like cool. amazing, input. amazing. Yeah. All that I love it. There's so much need for that because I think the more and also uh, naming and shaming, but without being too brutal is important because I think yeah. that reviews and feedback, whether public or private, will move the agenda forward. And if we don't say, guys, you, you messed that up, that was really badly done, then nothing will change. Or if we don't say, well done, then mm. other people won't go there. So we need to bet. But when, when we need to celebrate best practice, don't we? And say like, oh, they're the best. Let's all go there and spend our money. Yeah. And then people go, oh, we'll do it too. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, just looking to hear what. Um, let's go back to a bit of your TV career stuff. Um, there wasn't any questions around that sort of stuff anymore. Um, so I was really interested in a couple of the things you did. One of them was um, the worst place to be disabled in the world, which yeah. um, 
Do you want to explain about that? Because like yourself, I like to travel as well. And I've been to some places that um, basically accessibility isn't a thing. <laughs> yeah. But you went to somewhere that's really, really bad. Do you want to explain about what that was like? Well, it was it was an interesting premise. Basically, the BBC did a series where they're like, where's the world's worst place to be something? Where's the world's worst place to be a man? World's worst place to be a woman? Whatever, to be gay, to whatever. Um, and they, of course, asked, where's the world's worst place to be disabled? And Ghana was selected because a Human Rights Watch report had just gone out on some of the abuses that were happening there. But if I'm honest with you, Ben, we could have gone anywhere because there is no best place in the world to be disabled. There's a <laughs> lot of stuff all over the place. And it was, it was incredible to go there and to have my eyes blown wide open to the problems that people with disabilities face because I had been very ignorant to it before or naive to it before. I didn't know the full extent. And so witnessing the prayer camps, for example, where people with disabilities get sent to get healed and then the abuse that goes on there and then also meeting people like witch doctors who would sacrifice disabled children on birth and stuff all of that went on and it was a really powerful thing to make and be a part of but I think what it did is position me in my thinking of like right what matters here in the UK but also what matters globally and sometimes you know complaining about not being able to go to the local pub falls into just like you know it means nothing compared to the fact that in other countries people with disabilities are hidden away are you know completely and utterly the most victimized um people it's it's awful the statistics and i so i was very i feel very grateful that my kind of my learning around dis discrimination started there mm. but the documentary i think achieved some change. I mean, I actually it did achieve some, some lasting change in that the shackling and the, ch and the chaining that goes on there was pulled into question and some government pressure was, was put on um, from our government, the, from DFID, the Department for International Development. So it made an impact, but it was just, a, it was a very hard thing to film. But like I said, I think it was cool to sh shine a light in some of the things that happen all over the world. And most disabled people statistically are found in developing countries. And so to look and understand what happens is I think is important for us over in the UK because I think sometimes we can forget how lucky we are. And don't get me wrong, we have got a long way to go yeah. and there's a lot that needs to be done and I'll never sit on my laurels here and go, oh, it's all cool, because it's not. And there's discrimination yeah. across the board, on, on every level there's all sorts of stuff going on here that's wrong, but you, we, there's a lot out there that's, that's really bad. So that's why that documentary mattered so much, I think, both to me and I think you know, what, for for any viewers that got to see it, disabled or not, just to put that into place. Yeah, I am um, not quite on the same level, uh, but I went to Bali last year to do some volunteer work. Um, and they, because of their religion and their culture, they think if you're disabled, you've done bad in the previous life. Yeah, you're cursed. And they tend to lock them away and shut them away. And yeah, um, But yeah, their, their culture started to change and... Thanks to mainly thanks to the charity that I was working with, um, Bali Sports Foundation, and they basically go and find them in the community and get them out and get them playing sports because the power of sport has been amazing in their life, especially because now they are on Paralympic teams, they get sponsorship, and now they're being the main provider for their family. And yeah, so yeah sport it, has that power. It had it here too. Yeah. It, did, it did huge things here in the UK for the for shifting of perception, especially when it was broadcasted as well, didn't it, with the Paralympics? But I, I think it's important to remember when we talk about the attitudes that seem really outdated, that yeah. actually there's context there for why. Yeah. And I was quite young when I went and made the documentary and I found myself very judgmental about like, can't believe he's saying that he would kill disabled kids. But really having a disabled child in that, in that environment was was like game over you you know the cost of it and the the stigma around it it was it, it was not worth it was that you could understand why hello we uh run over the time limit there if you guys were watching so we're gonna get sophie back in any second now um and we get carrying on again there we go uh, do, 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 do. We back. Hi. Like, we, I, I, was, I, I can't believe it. I was like, Ben, where have you gone? <laughs> we, um, I couldn't believe it. We, we, re we reached the hour limit on Instagram I Live. Guess, so. I guess. Does that mean we need to stop? 
No, no, we carry on. No, no, we carry on. That's fine. Um, I couldn't believe how quick that went. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I was just you... jabbering away to myself. No, no, no. I was like, oh, man, where'd you go? <laughs> so, yeah, we're all back and lots of other people are back. That's good. Right, so what were we talking about? We are talking about the um, being in the worst place to be disabled yeah. and that. Um, I think, yeah, making programmes as a British person with a disability and then travelling. I think just travelling anywhere in the world with a disability and, like, seeing what else is out there and, like, learning about how other people have to manage and stuff. I find it fascinating, really fascinating, especially as a non-disabled, as, as somebody that wasn't born disabled and coming into the disabled world and then going out there and going, right, oh, Christ, what is it like here? You know, that's yeah. really insightful. Yeah, definitely. And you're saying, obviously, there's no real best place to be disabled, but... <laughs> I'd like to know, and somebody else did ask as well, um, where some of the best places have you been in terms of your experiences? Not necessarily accessible stuff, but in terms oh, of wow. it's been amazing. I, 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 well, in terms of access, I'd say the States has been, for me, one of the best places. The States and Canada. Um, I've just, I spent a month in, Cal in California in January and I just changed my life. I was like, Christ, this is living. Like, you don't even need to think about access. You don't need to think about it. You go somewhere and you're like, I can get in. You don't even need to, you know, it's, it was weird for me because I normally, like little things, Ben, I'd say things like, instead of going up to the waiter and, at the place and saying, um, have, you got, have you got a disabled toilet? You just say, where, where are the loos? Oh, sorry, where are the bathrooms, you know? Because yeah. the disabled toilets were in the bathrooms and stuff like that. You're like, cool. Like that integration, that natural integration made life just so cool. So traveling there, I was just like, this is amazing. Um, and Canada, I found really cool. Australia, I loved. Um, developing, not, it's, it's always a bit harder, but I love, I mean, I love Europe. I'm a, I'm a sucker for kind of beautiful old towns. And I, <laughs> having got a Batek, that really transformed my ability to really enjoy those kind of places. So yeah, I, yeah. I use my Batek everywhere and that means I can get around everything a lot easier and I'm not worried so much about access outside like Amsterdam or you know Barcelona or whatever just cruise around it so easily so that kind of a, I love that um but I mean honestly the list is as long as forever I love like there's so many amazing places <laughs> I can imagine yeah it seems like you you do travel quite a bit so uh, yeah you yeah, haven't given I, up on I, it. I, I, I awesome. do a lot with work as well which is really interesting so that's kind of a privilege um but no but more recently I've, I've started I think in my older age I've started to enjoy places that are accessible. When I was younger, I didn't. I was like, "Ah, oh, manage," and I'll, you know, take a mate, and we'll just get on with it. But now I'm like, I want to go somewhere that's accessible. Yeah. So America for me has been a place that I've enjoyed spending time because I'm like, I don't have to worry. I don't have to rely on my friends to help me. You know that stuff. I just that yeah. matters now. I'm kind of getting a bit bored of being like, "Oh, sh sorry, I can't." you know, get there, I can't do that. That's kind of getting a bit tired. So I'm, I'm gravitating to those places. So the UK as well, living in London, I think I'm getting a bit city bound as well because it's just a bit easier sometimes. But yeah, I love it. I love traveling. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I, it seems like you do um, a lot of it, not just the, it's quite lucky that you can get to do it with work as well. So yeah. that must be an amazing feeling that you can integrate into your, your passion, into your, um, your work life. Um, so obviously we were talking, um, about there a little bit, you are a, your thing that most people know you for is being on the Paralympics. Um, how did that come about and what was it like? Cause I'm a little bit jealous. Well, it's so I it. <laughs> it was, I'm not joking. The best and worst and the most amazing and most terrifying experience I've ever had. So I, I basically... The Channel 4 were looking to extend the coverage team, the people that would be anchoring and reporting and um, uh, sitting in the studio. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh my God, I've got, it's gone out of my head. I know, it doesn't matter. Um, so they were looking for to expand the team. And I went to an audition essentially. And it was like a sort of three or four day long audition. And there was loads of people there that you would know, um, Steve Brown and like people like presenters, presenters with disabilities. And, uh, we went through the ringer. We were put through our paces on like having to try and learn to do live broadcasting, which is terrifying. And I'd never done before. And just it's a skill set that is just like, Whoa. so anyway, I got that um, opportunity and I got it. I got the job. So me and um, this other presenter called JJ 
went out to Rio, um, but we were put through training, intensive training before we went. And I, it was the most terrifying, hardest job I've ever done. I, I don't remember any of it. I blank it all out because it was going live, sitting behind a studio desk with this camera looking at you and they're going You see me now? Hello. Ah, oh, hi. You're back? You're right, I guess. I'm back. Okay. Um, um, so, what about um, what sort of unique challenges were there between the like, um, recorded and the live? You were saying it was quite oh scary. Oh, God. Live is like this we're sitting here hmm. and everyone's watching, and you cannot get up. You've got <laughs> to get it right. And, and you've got people screaming in your ear, you have a headset in your ear. And they're saying to you, right, okay, just keep right. We're going to go to the swimming in a minute. And they're, they're speaking to you all the time whilst you're talking like this all the time. They're giving you directions, la, 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 la. And then, then they'll suddenly shout at you, right, get to the swimming, get to the swimming. Or go to the, go to the track, go to the track. Or, you, or something, and you've got to go, instead of going, oh, right, you've got to go calmly. Okay, right now, time to get down to the swimming. Where the, and inside, you're going, ah. But you've got to stay calm, and, and you've got to be collected. And, I mean, you've got to not swear and you've got to behave, and you've got to read every, like the auto cues coming up thick and fast, and you've got to read, like, you've got to be really awake, but it's fun. Whereas um, when you're doing the pre-recorded stuff, it's like, you just say it, and then if, you, if it's not right, you record it again. So you've got mm -hmm. time to get it right, but it's not as fun and quick as fun. So there's benefits and, and advantages to one and the, and the other, but yeah, the live stuff is like, I can't even describe. <laughs> You, I, I know that you said everyone lo looks at you. I actually, do you know what's funny? When we first went live, someone tweeted us saying, these two look totally out of their depth. And I saw the tweet and I was like, Shh. and I was like, no, you're totally right. I'm completely out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. And every time I do live stuff, I'm the same. It's like, it's just, no, it's no words for it. It's very scary, but it's exhilarating and fun. So, yeah. Did you find that you got a bit more, like, as you went through, were you getting a bit more comfortable? Yeah, you, know, you get into Definitely. the rhythm. Definitely, you calm down and you get the grips with it and you just sort of slowly get there. Um, and I was so looking forward to Rio, uh, Tokyo. Christ, that was mm. going to be so much fun. But next year, it's going to be next year. Do you think you'll go? Do you think you'll get out there? Well, I was planning on, so I was having a three month holiday where I started in Bali doing the same stuff I did last year. Amazing. Moving on to Singapore, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, and then ending up in Japan for the Paralympics. And oh I had God. I had arranged fifteen interviews with athletes out there. The either friends of mine from previous years or oh, that. And wow. but it just means I don't have to delay it till next year. But yeah, yeah so. basically like this kind of thing where it's like two hour well, it'll be on my longer ones that I do in the past. I do like two, between two and three hour sit down conversation. We delve like really deep into different topics and what they're specifically passionate about. And yeah, that was my plan to do some of that stuff out there. So, oh, but man, it just means I guess it next It will happen. It's just going to yeah. have to wait. I, 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 it's such a shame, but I'm hoping everything will just kind of go back. It's just, yeah, it's just a waiting game now, isn't it? <laughs> that sounds yeah. awesome though. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was. It, it's still going to happen, but it's yeah. just, <laughs> just wait another year. Just another year. Just, just means to get a few other things in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a few other things I picked up about. Um, we're just going uh, a little bit. So you had the opportunity to do some work with Stella McCartney on Adidas. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, how how what was, how did that come about? And um, I didn't see too. I was trying to find more information about it, but I couldn't so far. I just asked it you. It was really small. It, it was something that. I kind of just has followed me ever since. It was literally a tiny campaign that Stella McCartney was doing for Adidas for the 2012 games. And I just got cast as one of the models. It was like, no big deal. It was weird. Normally they like, you know, if the disabled models used, everyone goes mad about it, makes a big song and dance and the designers make a fuss of it and tell everyone what they're doing. And it's all like, look at me, look at me. But no, it was just like, yep, yeah, we'll just use a wheelchair, a girl in a wheelchair. And it was awesome. It was really cool. I was up in a billboard in London and stuff. It was just like, what? But it was kind of a 
sort of swallowed up within the 2012 games. So mm -hmm. it, it was no, it was nothing in the, in the scheme of things of everything that was yeah. going on then. But it was it was amazing. It was fun. I mean, I did a bit of modelling after this modelling show on BBC Three that I did, and that was kind of that was that. I did, it didn't go. I, it was not for me. That's not. I've got too much of a gulp. I've got too much to say than to just this model. So I just kind of, and I also am not good looking enough for that kind of shit. So I just, that, that was a one time, but it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And um, something that I saw as well, I don't know if it was rela uh, related to it, but the, the manic wall. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, what was that I, I decided that I really wanted to see disabled people represented in retail. Um, and that started off as designing a mannequin wheelchair. So I just wanted to see a mannequin sitting in a wheelchair so that I could see the clothes sitting better. That was a simple idea, but it's evolved massively from there. And now my kind of uh, proposal to retailers is more than just using a mannequin. It's the whole package is to sort of shift the thinking about how important it is to communicate effectively with disabled customers. Um, and on, I want to say disabled, I mean all sorts of disability. Mm -hmm. And so my, I moved into consultancy work in the last two or three years where I start working to sort of help retailers rethink how they mm -hmm. work with disabled people and what are the problems and how can they ch like solve them and how can the disabled person be empowered and enabled. And, and so the, the mannequin started as this as a small idea and it just evolved. So yeah, um, I'm working with a retailer in the States a huge retailer in the States um, at the moment and fingers crossed we'll see some stuff like that coming up later in the year which will be really cool um, and here I'm working with a couple of retailers here in the UK too so it's just slowly slowly chipping away at the kind mm. of agenda and trying to just bring disability into that field it's like you know it's a passion and I, I kind of I do make time for it when I'm not doing presenting I really do make time to try and get in there and do something different to try and you know, further that agenda because someone's got to and, and, and there's a lot of people in this space pushing forward and I think collectively we can make an impact, you know, so it's it's yeah, it's fun. It's hard, yeah. but it's fun. Imagine it's fun, yeah. And um, I'll get your thoughts on the situation as well, but I always think that if you make stuff accessible for everyone, it actually makes the things better for the people that don't need it to be more accessible. Absolutely. Um, Universal yeah. design is is the key to to life. I mean, once you start reconfiguring how you think and making designing with inclusivity just as a it's just part of it, then like, for example, we talk about things like the mobile phone and some of the functions that were integrated into the mobile phone were, were not designed for disability specifically. They're designed just for everybody. So things like Siri using voice technologies and various different functions and formats have been put into our day-to-day -day life and they benefit people with disabilities. And that's just the way it should be. It shouldn't be an afterthought. And it's always an afterthought. It's always like, oh, we yeah. should maybe think of how we can make things inclusive. But the more we're seeing designers from the start, you know, from university time, from the beginning when they're studying, integrate disability and integrate inclusivity in a in a in a wider in a wider context it just changes everything it's just it's really exciting to see and i don't know about you ben but i get contacted a lot by students at universities and colleges around the country and around the world asking if, oh then in my in my degree and my master's in my phd i'm doing stuff on disability and it's so yeah. encouraging because they're like whatever area they're in they're thinking about disability from that point. And so the world will slowly start to change just naturally without it being put, forced upon. Instead of it being all, of everything being retrofitted, as it were, you mm. know, adding ramps, it will just be in there. And I don't mean just physical access. I mean, everything across the board, just the way of thinking. It's, I think that's, that's the future. Yeah. Um, well, it's amazing the work you're doing. Um, and I think that's sort of a good place to wrap up. I will just say, if anybody's got more, any more questions, just pop them in and we can ask them sort of in the last sort of 10 minutes. Um, I don't have anything else written down here in terms of questions. I don't Thanks, think. Ben. This has been cool to chat. It's a, it's oh, a nice it's been, feature. Yeah. I think it's it, so important what you're doing, just bringing in different voices and sharing sharing the love. There's like some really interesting people on, on social media with disabilities sort of doing such fascinating things all over the place, isn't there? It's such a yeah, cool, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's such a nice time right now, given everyone being at home, just to kind of 
shine a spotlight into that little dark corner and and bring people out and show people what everyone's doing it's it's really i like it yeah so how are you feeling about lockdown now I, I work on the PC like all the, all the time anyway. The only thing I'm missing is going to the gym. Yeah. Like I, not, I normally go to the gym five times a week um, and I normally go for quite a long sort of, I lo- I'm really lucky where I live. It's right by the sea and I've got loads of like Amazing. paths that go along the waterfront. Yeah. So yeah, um, for that it's, um, I love going out there. Me and Alice like to go for long walks and yeah, yeah that's, you know, so it's just that side of it I'm missing, but it's not, I mean, if it was really wet for like three weeks, I would have probably <laughs> wouldn't be going that snowing. much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, also, yeah, if it snowed, it would just be the same. So, um, yeah, it's, I don't feel like it's changed much. And I've, with what I'm doing on here, it's been um, it's very better. busy. Yeah, <laughs> you've been so busy. And I guess it's easier to get hold of people. I mean, for yeah. me, I'm the same. I, if I need to reach people, you're like, you're not. I know that you're at home. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to pin you down. It's just yeah. easier. So, yeah, it's been, I reached out to 25 people originally and every single one of them came back and said, yeah, love to do it. I was, no like, <laughs> I was like, hang on, <laughs> I'm not ready for this. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, so, well yeah. done and thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to be, um, to be on here and to chat and, and for, to ramble on about myself for an hour and a bit. Yeah, no, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, I didn't see any more questions pop up. So. Is there any questions? No, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, So thank you, everybody, for watching. Those who don't know who I am, uh, who have come through um, Sophie's Instagram, my name's Ben. I'm also in a wheelchair. I'm a quadriplegic, and every single day at 6 p.m. British summertime, that's our time here in the UK at the moment, I'm here live with a different person every day and basically just having a chat with them, getting to to know them more, seeing what they're up to and seeing how they're coping with the current situation. So yeah, if you want to see more of that, head over to my Instagram, Adapt to Perform, and check out that. And Sophie, for those people that who are coming here and don't know who you are, how should they find you and what should they do? Hiya, I'm Soph L. Morg on here. I would just add, if anyone's watching this up on my platform, it's a wheelchair user. Ben does some really good videos for workout wheelchair users. If you need some tips on how to keep fit and stuff, check out his stuff. I've been doing some of your stuff, Ben. It's really, really good. Um, and yes, I'm Sophie, Soph L. Morg on here. I'm also on Twitter a little bit. Soph L. Morg, no, Soph Morg TV. Um, mm. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I was just say because you said about the workouts. Um, oh, yeah. Basically, um, well, at 5 p.m. every day, so an hour before this um, went live, I've been doing live workouts as well. Kind of like what Joe Wicks is doing, but it's uh, for wheelchair users every yeah. single day. And um, also, one, I started before him. He stole my idea. <laughs> and, um, we're, seeing, by the way, that, we're seeing a lot of that happening right now. A lot of celebrities stealing ideas that people like you have been doing for ages. It's, it's, a, bit yeah. of a, it's a bit of a frustration. Yeah. Um, so if you want to see someone who's actually in a wheelchair doing a yeah. wheelchair workout for wheelchair users, yeah, be sure to check my stuff out. Yeah. Um, and if you don't want to watch it live, I've got 80 videos for wheelchair user fitness videos, various different types. So really, really good. Them. I just did the um, yeah, the H I I T one, and then I did what's the other one? I want to do the ski erg one. I've just bought myself a ski erg. I was like, right, ah, I'm yeah. going to do this. I'm going to be commit to my commit to this. But I'm out on the handbike quite a lot, which is good. But no, your videos are brilliant. I encourage anyone who's <laughs> actually just anyone can do them. Actually, <laughs> they're really yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, the most common question I got out get or well, the most common comment I get afterwards is like, I, I both love you and hate you after this because <laughs> yes. I found something that I can do, but I hate how hard it was. <laughs> oh, I just seen Todd in the train station. Hi, James. So that's my PT in the real world. Oh, yeah, awesome. I got a skier because I thought, why not? Because I started, I started with 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 James and um, to get fit for my bike trip. And I need, and I really enjoyed the skier. It was great for just if I didn't want to go out on my handbike. And I'm, um, I just love that. So, but no, I mean, I think just mixing it up yeah. is the key to success. I'm, I'm going to set up a skier here at some point. Oh, Probably. you can get one. Yeah. So oh. next to my handbike, I'm going to get one here so I can do some more workouts at home. I mean, they're a lot of money. They're a lot of money, but I think I was going to try and make it worth it. The investment <laughs> is like, right now, I've spent it. Do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Because I haven't announced it yet, but I've got a big long distance event that i'm going to be doing in september um fitness wise so i need to get really fit so now i'm at home i need to get 
because I haven't quite announced it yet, so I don't want to say what it is. But okay, um, don't, don't, at least get fit. Yeah, get the ski. I mean, I think, and you did a, you did a video on it, didn't you, the ski oak? And I think mm -hmm. it's one of those that I've, I've realised ever since James, um, who's just coming to the train station, uh, introduced me to it, and I enjoyed it as a bit of cardio because I feel as a wheelchair user, cardio is not the easiest thing to do. Um, I'm new to fitness. I'm not a big fitness person. You would know all about this, Ben, but I'm not. And I and without my hand bike, I just found myself getting a bit frustrated. You know, I. The, just going for a run thing that everyone else could do. Um, yeah. what, what's the equivalent? So I've really enjoyed that, and I, I thought, right, I'm just going to get one at home. So I think it's well, the, I think it's it the best. Already. Yeah, it's the <laughs> best cardio piece of equipment for wheelchair users, mainly because oh, I, I come in share. But when we're pushing our wheelchairs all day long, um, so we're pushing like this. What happens is these muscles get tight here. So if we're going on a hand bike, we're sort of doing the same thing, but yeah. with a ski bag. Is using the opposite muscles. We're using like pulling it towards us, using our back muscles. So it's better That's for it. our posture as well. So That's what, yeah, James, if you can so afford one, get one. Totally in agreement. James is always like, right, stop sticking your neck out, put your <laughs> shoulders back, pull from the back of the of this. Oh, look, I love it. Yeah, because I mean, it was. I'm always. I was all like this, like with my shoulders yeah, forward yeah. and all this. He's like, right, get your get your arms back. So that's what I, I'm going out on the hand bike. I'm doing more of the same. So I'm kind of a feeling a bit like, oh, so I thought, right, get skier, just, just, just chuck my money, do the, do the right thing. So yeah, yeah. I'll be looking for, and I'll, um, I'll do your challenge that you um, set on the thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, I feel like we could talk for ages more. Well, but well I'm, I'm here, I'm around, so we could do another one. Thank yeah, you definitely. So much, um, ben. Honestly, thank oh. you for what you're doing as well. It's really, really, oh. it's really cool. All right, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking. Thanks, guys. Bye, Thanks everyone. everyone watching. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>